Well, good morning, Lakeside. I am thankful again to be back um, here at Lakeside and excited to see what God is going to do in our lives this morning. Uh, Once again, my name is Tim, and I'm serving here as the interim pastor until the Lord brings uh, the next lead pastor to this congregation. And I'm looking so forward to what God is going to do in the coming months and uh, fully have confidence that God will see to have the exact right guy come here at the exact right time. Maybe not exactly right according to our timetable or the exact right guy according to our needs and wants, but according to God, I know that that will happen. So, this morning, um, we're going to be looking at our series, our ongoing series, and this is the final week of the book of Ephesians. Uh, in our series, Hashtag Living in Christ. And today's uh, sermon is titled, Battle Ready. Now, a few years back, I was coaching a volleyball team, and our theme for the year was Battle Ready. We had warm-up shirts printed with Battle Ready across the front, and I wanted our girls to be prepared for our games. And having this mentality of, hey, we are ready for the battle. We know that when we encounter an opponent, that we are going to be in a battle to win a game. And I wanted them to have this mentality in their minds of being ready for the upcoming battle. And the book of Ephesians, and primarily Ephesians chapter 6, says that we need to be ready for spiritual battles. And many of us can be lulled to sleep, even in the Christian church, to think, you know what, there really aren't that many battles. There's really not struggles. Um, And we all know, if we think for a second, we all know that there are struggles. And a phrase that is really, really popular right now is, um, the struggle is real. You'll see this printed on t-shirts. You'll see high school students and college students, uh, you'll hear them saying this phrase, the struggle is real. And if we're honest with ourselves, there are real struggles. Sometimes we get into a denial mentality where we deny that there is a struggle, but there is. And the book of Ephesians, the end of chapter 5 and the beginning of chapter 6, even indicates to us where those struggles happen. And it is very, very clear that most of life's struggles happen in our marriages, happen in parenting, and happen at work. And if we all pause right now and think about our marriages and our parenting and our work, I'm sure there's already struggles coming to mind. I can guarantee, because every single marriage I know has struggles. Think about it. There's two imperfect people that join together to create a married couple, and there is going to be struggle in that. We should expect, expect struggle in our lives and in our marriages, in our parenting and in our work. But we don't need to sit and wallow in the struggle. We have hope. We have hope in the midst of the struggle. And and we do not go it alone. If we look at marriage, and at the end of chapter 5, last week we we touched on this a bit. But it, it calls us as husbands to love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, I don't know if this past week you pondered the reality of what does it mean to be Christ-like? What does it mean to love my wife as Christ loved the church? Now, as men, we're not going to do this perfectly. We need to understand that as we step forward into our marriage, um, we are going to encounter struggles both with our wives, but our greatest struggle is not with our wife. Our greatest struggle is with ourselves 
and the evil one who is trying to de- de- disrail or derail our marriages. Marriage is certainly under attack. Currently, I have a number of friends that are either going through a divorce or going through great struggle. And I can only imagine that here this morning, um, there are many marriages that are struggling. Once again, the struggle is real. And as I've even counseled married couples and talked with them, a lot of times the husband is telling me all the problems about the wife and the wife is telling me all about the, the problems with her husband and if, if the other spouse was just fixed, life would be better. It is very, very difficult for us to say, you know what, I need to be transformed by the power of Jesus and by the power of his grace-filled gospel. I need to take a self-assessment of me and say, Lord, reveal my sinful patterns and allow me to receive your grace and allow me to walk in love. And as we walk in love and realize that our spouse is not the problem, in this passage uh, in Ephesians, we're going to see that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Although it appears to be. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. And we'll get to that in a little bit. But this also carries on to the whole idea, um, and, and wives, it says that we, as wives, uh, see that you respect your husbands. Now, some husbands don't deserve the respect because of their sin, but wives are called to respect their husband in that process. And if there's a husband and a wife that are both surrendering their wills to God and saying, God, you are supreme above both of us. We want to submit to your authority in our marriage. All of a sudden, there can be a beautiful thing brought about. The Holy Spirit can convict us of our sin. We can confess our sin and in our confession, realize God's grace and grow in our marriages. So my hope and prayer is that if your marriage is struggling here this morning, my hope and prayer is that the grace of God would seep in to your marriage and that you would be radically transformed by what God is going to do. The words that I'm going to say up here aren't going to transform you or fix you. The word of God can. And, and that is exactly, I believe, why we're gathered together this morning. The struggle is real in marriage. We need to own up to the reality that the struggle is real, but we don't need to camp out there. We don't need to live there. We need to live as those that have hope. Now, parenting is a whole nother uh, struggle. Uh, <laughs> did I, can I get an amen? <laughs> um, <laughs> parenting. Um, it, there is nothing that God uses more than parenting to reveal our selfishness. As parents, um, all of a sudden our, our selfishness is brought to the surface as soon as we have a little baby that demands our attention and demands our every waking moment. That they, they have needs and we need to meet them. And we feel like, how am I going to survive being a young parent? And then as our kids grow, the problems just seem to increase. The struggles go from being something you could fix with $10 to something you need about $100 to fix to all of a sudden you're getting a phone call going, what? this is a $1,000 fix. And, and up from there, you know, it, it gets progressively more difficult. But in this passage, it says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Listen to this, fathers. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. A lot of times, as fathers, we want to bring discipline because a kid is not obeying us, and we want them to obey us. And we get really 
angry at them because they're not doing what we want them to do. Maybe it's because they're making us look bad that we get frustrated. Maybe it's because they're not obeying my will that, that gets me frustrated. But as fathers and as mothers, we need to discipline out of their best interest. Not out of what we want, but what God wants for them. And as people, sometimes we get very frustrated with little ones when they don't obey us. And then our adult, as, a, as kids grow up into being adults, uh, it's no less frustrating. You'd like to change them. But like I've said many times before, we can't change others. That's God's job. And so as we parent, it's as though we are coming alongside God and God is doing his work through us. It's not us doing work for God to change our children. We cannot make our children more Christ-like. The reality is, it's God going to do his work through us to bless our children. And we can either discipline them in anger and get them to line up with our agenda, or we can say God might have a greater agenda for my child, and God may even want to use me for his grace to flow through and impact my child so that they are radically different than, and, and they desire to obey because of a heart of surrender to Jesus. Parenting is a struggle. But there is another struggle yet that we face, and it is at work. This passage goes on to say, bond servants Obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not in a way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bondservants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as, the Lord, um, as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Masters, do the same thing and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. So whether you're an employee or the boss, there is one that's over you. You could be the President of the United States and there is someone over you. His name is Jesus. And this levels the playing field. It says if you're, wor if you're a worker working for a boss, work at it as though you're working for God because you are. Don't work for men. Whatever your job entails, you're working for God. You're God's representative at that workplace. And if you're a boss, don't think you're above your employees because there is one that is above you. This levels the playing field in the work environment where we can come to the Lord and say, Lord, you have given me the job you have placed me in. Thank you. Thank you for your provision of a job. But allow me to realize that if I'm a worker, I'm working for you. And if I'm a boss, I'm working for you. So that levels the playing field. And the struggle, like I said, is real even in the work environment. Um, it's very easy. I'm sure we could uh, all kind of dialogue a little bit right now. I'm, we don't have time, but I'm sure we could dialogue a bit right now about the frustrations we have at work and how if only I had a better boss, my life would be so much easier. Or if only I had better employees that obeyed what I told them to do. Wow, life would be amazing. But the reality is God has given you the employer he's given you or he's given you the employees he has given you on purpose. The people that are there are there not by mistake. And God is the God over all. And we need to remember that. So... In these three specific areas, we need to remember uh, that there is hope in the struggle, and his name is Jesus. In our marriages, in our parenting, 
and in our work, whatever God has called you to, there is hope. Don't be overwhelmed by the struggles. Don't even fix your eyes on the struggles. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Because when we fix our eyes on Jesus, we see that he is bigger than any struggle we can face. But when we fix our eyes on the struggle, all of a sudden the struggle seems bigger than our God. And God is certainly more infinitely powerful than any struggle you could ever face. I love this passage. In the past, we talked about some things we need to take off and some things we need to put on. In this passage, it talks about what we need to put on, and what we need to put on is the armor of God. I love verses 10 and 11. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may, ab- may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. We can't stand against the the schemes of the devil on our own strength. It is impossible. But when we put on the armor of God, when we allow him to clothe clothe, clothe us with his armor, we can live in a radically different way. Even though the struggles are coming at us, even though the schemes of the devil are waging war against us, we don't need... We don't need to shrink back. We can stand firm. I love that it says that we should stand firm in a few few upcoming verses. Uh, Verse 12 goes on to say, And we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. To sum up this passage, our struggle is not with flesh and blood. It's not with people. Our ultimate struggle is against the devil and his schemes to destroy us, to derail our marriages, to derail our parenting, to derail our work. He would love nothing more than to make that all a distortion, to confuse us, to mess us up. But what God wants to do is bring hope to us in the midst of the struggle. So it says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil days, in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, have having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace and all circumstances take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god it goes on to focus our attentions on to prayer apart from prayer I think we are powerless. But when we say, okay, God, I am weak and I need your strength, and we say, uh, we say along with Paul, uh, this idea of that we are praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayers and supplication, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that the words that the that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak so paul is saying you know what instead of being overwhelmed by the struggle let's join what god is doing let's put on our armor and let's prayerfully consider what God would have us do. And let's not just go into the world and hope we survive. Let's go into the world and take back the world with the power of the gospel. He doesn't want us to just um, stop worrying and be okay. 
He wants us to say, you know what? The hope that Christ has given me, I want to give to others. And he encouraged, encourages the church in Ephesus to pray. And tomorrow night, we're going to have an opportunity to pray. Not only for people to come to Good Friday and Easter services, but that the gospel of Jesus Christ would radically transform each and every one of us as well as those that we invite to come to church with us. I believe that that is exactly what Paul is doing here. He is praying and saying, we want the gospel of Jesus Christ to radically transform the people that we are near. So if we sum up the passage from today, uh, the main, a few main ideas is that in our marriages, parenting, and work, we need to cling to the hope of the gospel. We will encounter struggles. And, and the second point here is know that we will have struggles. Don't be in denial anymore. If there's a struggle, face it head on with the hope of Jesus Christ. Don't think, oh, you know what, the struggle, if I ignore it, if I deny it, it'll just go away. Face the struggle head on and say, God, I believe that I can have hope in the midst of my struggle because you are greater than the struggles I face. We can also go on to know that our struggles are not against flesh and blood. When we encounter struggles, we do one of two things usually. We either blame someone else for our struggle or we run. I want to encourage you that there is a third option. And that third option is that we can grow in the grace of Jesus Christ. That third option is that when we face a struggle, we can say, this is a struggle. What do I do? And we can remember that we should put on the armor of God and in prayer come to God and say, God, I need you in the midst of this struggle. On my own, I cannot fix this struggle. I need your grace to transform my marriage. I need your grace to transform my parenting. I need your grace to go into the workplace and realize that you are above even my boss and that I can trust that you have placed me at the right place at the right time. We can go on and we can also stand firm in his mighty power. This idea of standing firm, of saying, you know what, I have confidence, not in myself. We're not standing firm in our power or in our knowledge or in our understanding. We are standing firm in his mighty power. And when we do that, um, amazing things can happen because we can stand confident in Christ. This whole series, we're talking about living in Christ. And when we encounter struggles, we need to live in Christ. We need to say, all right, I am going to stand right now, even though I feel weak, I feel insignificant, I feel unable, I'm going to stand firm in your mighty power, God. There is no other way I can stand. On my own, I will crumble to my knees, but I can stand firm in his mighty power. It also encourages us to put on the armor of God. And I want to encourage every one of us that as we go into this coming week, that we would look at Ephesians chapter 6 and unpack what does it mean to have the belt of truth buckled around our waist? What does it mean to have the breastplate of righteousness in place? What does it mean to have our feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace? What does it mean that we're holding a shield of faith that we can extinguish the arrows of the evil one that are coming at us? And what, what's the deal with this helmet of salvation? What is that about? And the only offensive, all those are defensive in their posture. The only offensive weapon or weapon we can use against the devil offensively is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's why I believe all of us need to get into Ephesians chapter 6 this coming week and realize that 
God has given us the armor for a purpose. He's given us his truth, his righteousness, his gospel, his faith, his salvation, and his word. They're all his. And he is giving us those blessed gifts of the armor of God that we can put on and that not only affect our Sunday morning life, but our everyday life. And lastly, I want to encourage all of us to pray. When we encounter a struggle, the very first gut reaction that should happen is prayer. But if we're honest with ourselves, that's sometimes the last thing. Sometimes we're encountering a struggle and we worry. Or we have fear well up in, within us. Or we become anxious. Or we become angry. Or we become frustrated. Or we become all these other things. And when we encounter struggles, we do not need to be fearful, fearful or anxious or worried. What we need to do is go to prayer and say, Lord, here is where I'm at. I'm encountering a struggle and I can't fix it. Help. Sometimes that's the best prayer ever. It's short, it's one word, help. But it's an honest prayer. When we encounter struggles, we need to be honest about our struggles, but we need to, in our struggles, have the hope of God in us that he makes available to us by clothing us with the armor of God. It's what he desires to do in our lives. And I guarantee, as you guys go forward into this coming week, myself included, we're all going to face temptations and struggles. There's not a person in this room that will not face a struggle this week. So we need, this isn't optional. We don't, you know, wear the armor of God if we want to. This is a blessed gift that God has given to us to receive, to put on his armor so that we can walk in a brand new way, that we can learn to walk living in Christ. So uh, we're going to pray, and then we'll hand it right back to the worship band and continue to worship our great God. Let's pray. Oh, dear Lord, we thank you, Lord, for even the struggles. Because the struggles show us that we are not self-reliant, but, Lord, we are Jesus-dependent. Lord, help us realize that in the struggles, we do not need to lose our hope. That in the struggles, Lord, you are there with us. Lord, whether those struggles are in our marriages or in our parenting or in our work, Lord, we don't need to worry. We can stand firm in your mighty power. And Lord, I pray that we would. I pray that when we encounter struggles this coming week, our knee-jerk reaction would be to pray. Lord, I pray that you would continue your work in and through us. And Lord, that that would radically transform each of us and those that we're in relationship with. Lord, I pray uh, this coming week that husbands and wives would respond differently to one another because of what you have done here this morning. Lord, I pray that children would obey their parents because you command it. And Lord, that parents would not uh, enrage their children, but Lord, that they would bring them up in the discipline of the Lord. And Lord, I pray that as we encounter struggles at work, Lord, that we would realize that you are Lord of all and over all. And Lord, that we can trust you in that. And Lord, I do pray right now that we would put on the armor that you have given us. Lord, cause us to live in a new way and cause that to bear witness to what you have done in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.